Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are joining us. As we wait just about a minute to let people trickle in, um, we would love for you to introduce yourself in the chat. So the chat is going to be on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you don't see the chat tab, look in the bottom right-hand corner and you'll see a little chat icon. Just tap on that to open it up. Once you find it, head to the chat, introduce yourself, uh, share where you're joining us from, share your role in the, your district or your um, school um, and or grade level that you teach, just so we can get an idea of who we have today. And like I said, we're going to wait just a minute or so to get started to let everyone uh, trickle in. I see you, Jed. Hi, Jed. <laughs> Pally, Kyle from Osage. I saw you last week. No, I didn't. Did I? I think I did. <laughs> and welcome, Vicky. Jody's a third grade teacher from San Francisco. I love San Francisco. Used to live there. I saw Dan Thomas scroll by. Oh, we have a bonjour. I wonder if we're being joined from France. Oh, could be French Canadian. Oh, very true. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that, Brian. Oh, good morning from the Philippines. Thank you for joining wow. us. Hawaii. I saw Hawaii. I can't keep up. <laughs> I know. There's so I thought I was scrolling fast, but I'm not. We have New Zealand and Texas, Honduras, Georgia. Hong Kong. Incredible. Thailand. Wow, Arizona. I love this. North Carolina, Mexico. Oh my goodness, they just keep coming and coming. This is so great. We love how diverse of an audience we have tonight. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started because we have so much amazing content to cover tonight. So today, today, tonight, wherever you are, you're going to meet a computer science expert, Brian Aspinall. And during our time together, Brian will share about the history of computer science and the importance and benefits of teaching it in your classroom. Now, at the end of the session, we are going to share a variety of Seesaw lessons that will help you integrate C uh, computer science into your classroom. And we're also going to be giving away 10 copies of Brian's book, When Passion Meets Project. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you have questions during the session that you would like Brian to answer, there will be a Q&A session towards the end. Um, please go ahead and click on the Q&A tab and ask them there. This ensures that we won't miss them. And if any questions go in unanswered, we will reach out to you and answer them after the webinar. Now, other comments or ideas can be put in the chat tab that you all are using right now to introduce yourselves. Um, and if you, you know, have the option or if you don't see the chat, cause you still haven't introduced yourself reminder, go to the bottom right hand of your screen, tap on that little chat icon. And you're going to notice that there's a chat tab. There's a Q and a tab as well as a handouts tab where we will be sharing some handouts and links throughout the session. Now this session is being recorded and a link to the recording as well as the handout and some other resources um, from this webinar will be shared in a follow-up email in about 24 to 48 hours after the session is complete. Now, you all have introduced yourself, so who are we? Really quickly, my name is Allie, and I'm a training and professional development specialist here at Seesaw. I'm a former fourth and fifth grade teacher, as well as a reading interventionist and an instructional coach. And I live in Denver, Colorado. I was trying to see if I saw anyone from Colorado, but <laughs> again, everyone was introducing themselves so fast, I missed it. Um, but so excited to be here. And I'm really excited to also have my colleague Cheryl with me today, and she's gonna introduce herself. Thanks, Allie. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheryl, and I'm also a fourth grade teacher, former fourth grade teacher from California, originally from the 808. I see you, Hawaii. But now I am in Atlanta, Georgia, and at Seesaw as a learning experience designer, developing some amazing collections that we'll get to take a look at today. Thanks, Cheryl. So now, who's our expert? Brian. Brian Aspinall is an educator and best-selling author and is considered one of the brightest STEM innovators in education. He's the founder of Codebreaker Inc., an organization whose mission is to engage students and amplify voices of passionate educators, like all of you, I'm sure, who believe that all students can achieve if given a fair chance. He travels the globe and leading professional development programs that inspire educators to create curious seeking individuals in classrooms built on a community of trust, 
of risk taking and a freedom to fail, which I think as an adult, I even sometimes need that reminder. He was awarded the Canadian Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence for his work with coding and computational thinking. And his enthusiasm, thought leadership, and approach to building capacity within STEM education is why we have invited him to speak with us today. So welcome, Brian, and take it away. Thank you very much, friends. Hello, world. My name is Brian Aspinall. This is my teaching seventh and eighth grade up here, here in beautiful Ontario, Canada. And for the last five, I've been teaching at a variety of faculty of education across Marty. Marty is here. And here you will see my wonderful friends who are six years old. And to get this party started, I want to give one away. So I've got a free Marty robot for anybody here. All you have to do is tweet. Tag at this Raspinall tag. Find your own free trial. Hey, Brian. Sorry to interrupt. I think we're having a little audio trouble. Is there a way that you can jump onto a different uh, Wi Fi? Yes, Playlist. sorry about that. Brian, like in mind hopping on to you remember Wi-Fi. His, now his audio is catching up to us. So there we go. Are you back with us? Okay, we'll give him a minute. However, I did catch from that that there is a free giveaway tweeting out to him. So when Brian comes back and joins us, we will definitely make sure that he reshares that giveaway since that sounded like a really awesome free uh, chance. So appreciate you all bearing with us. Uh, while we have some audio. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Welcome back, Brian. Oh, sorry about that. My friends, no. we, you know, when uh, you live in the middle of nowhere, as you know, we're talking about equity and all things education. So I have very limited access considering I'm the, the coder. I actually have three internet streams coming into my house trying to wow. magnify it all. So are we good now? We are. I think that the audience would probably love if you want to hop back and share that giveaway, because I know I got excited when I saw that. Just <laughs> share that again so everyone has the chance to enter. Thank you. Here we go. We're giving away a wonderful Marty robot. Simply tweet why you should win. Make sure you tag Mr. Aspinall at CodeBreakerEDU. Don't forget to use the hashtag CodeBreaker. And if you can't wait... Get a free trial on us at codebreakeredu.com slash Marty. I got to go back in time, though. I remember graduating high school in the mid-90s, and this is what a 10-hour playlist looked like. Do you remember joining Columbia House, quitting Columbia House, trying to buy 12 albums for a penny and thinking you were outsmarting the system? Kids these days have no heart of how hard it was to actually make a playlist. Do you remember Y2K, 1999? And if you're on this call and you don't, you're Gen X and you are way younger than me. So Y2K was the end of 1999. And we weren't sure if computer scientists had allocated for the last two digits of the calendar year or simply the first two. Software was written in the early 1990s. And we weren't sure if the calendar clock was going to roll over from 1999 to 1900. It was a wild time to be alive. I remember 1995. Oh, I was trying to study at the University of Windsor here in Ontario, and I had to hand in code over this sound. Do you remember dial-up? Yahoo chat was all the rage. We were telling students, don't talk to strangers. I'm going to let the sound bite finish. I'm going to let the sound bite finish because it's just as annoying today as it was in 1995. But fast forward now, look how far we've come. We literally message people on the internet and get in their car. We literally message people on the internet and go sleep at their house. 
Uber and Airbnb are two of the biggest companies in the world. They don't sell their own product or service. In fact, they figured out a way to monetize and empower members of their community to go out and monetize themselves as far often or as far little as they want. And there's a lot of value to that philosophy if we apply it to our classrooms. It follows engagement, it follows empowerment, but it also follows student choice. Today's technology is the worst technology our students will ever use. And I always like starting my presentations with this because we're always thinking about the past, we're always thinking about the present, but we never really look to the future, especially in education, with the exception of always preparing for the next. The school system is the one space where we're always talking about preparing kids for more school. And while today's technology might be the worst our students will ever use, it's pretty wild. Here's a Rube Goldberg machine made by six-year-olds. We're taping paper towel rolls to the wall. We're collaborating. We're running marbles through. It's more of a trial and error experience. And it's very much maker ed. Now, how do we bring this into the computer science space? Well, <laughs> so happy when it hits the bell. Why don't we kick off with a B-Bot robot to actually start our Rube Goldberg machine? They got it. Pretty wild to be teaching in 2022. We use Dash and Dot robots to try and pop balloons as an experiment. You know what I love about that video is this idea of letting kids try and try again. With these technologies, particularly in computer science, it challenges us to redefine what it means to fail at school. Uh, majority of our students, when they're learning to code, their code won't run that first time through. And that moment, that moment of debugging, that's quite often when innovation can begin. And it challenges us to rethink our assessment evaluation practices, particularly in math. Math is that one subject area that's usually scored based on a quantity of correct answers. How about bringing our stuffed animals to life using Makey Makey? My friend here is in first grade in Toronto, Ontario. Leopard baby cubs learn how to hunt catching mice and rabbits. Koalas have two thumbs on each hand so they can climb trees. Or in this case, we have a six-year-old that wanted to bring her story to life using Makey Makey and a Cartesian grid system, as you can see on the screen here. We're talking X, Y variables in first grade. I'm just gonna put this one oh, over here. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 And now there's the maker experience. We have to create the buttons, the physical computing part. So she's created two switches to interact with her scratch story. What I love about those kind of examples is that 
we're, we're shifting more into the physical computing space. For the better part of the last decade, I feel that coding and computer science have almost become synonymous. And we have to recognize that under the big umbrella of computer science, we have a hardware track and we have a software track. And our little people, right down to kindergarten, can even engage with these robotics and a lot of the physical computing tools that we have with us today. I want to go back and share a story. At my last school, I was teaching seventh grade and eighth grade, and I was coaching the senior boys basketball team. And it was January. And where I live in the province of Ontario, Canada, it gets incredibly dark, 4.15 in the afternoon in January. And it was really snowy outside. And I was getting text messages from my wife, who's also an educator. We were both teaching seventh grade at the time. And she was saying, the roads are really bad. You're going to want to get home. And I was driving this beautiful Mazda B4000 pickup truck, which is just strictly rear-wheel drive. So at Canadian Thanksgiving October, I always say, I'm going to go put weight in the back of the truck so it's not fishtailing in the snow. And then when American Thanksgiving rolls around in the middle of November, I still haven't done it. So when January came, I was not prepared to drive this vehicle through the snow. Rear-wheel drive, very, very dangerous. After the student finally got picked up after basketball practice around 5.30 that night, I found my driving home as carefully as I could, and I pulled into my wife, the single-lane driveway at the time, and I made a mistake because I was in a hurry, which is quite ironic because I'm always saying to my students, were you taking your time or were you rushing to get to art, rushing to get to recess, rushing to get to phys ed, whatever the case might be. Ironically, I locked my keys in the truck. My wife's bell time started before mine, so she had to get out of the driveway before me the very next day. I walked in the house, and I looked at her, and I said, Honey, I have a problem. And she said, I know. I said, No, 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 you don't understand. I parked behind you in the driveway, and I locked my keys in the truck. I don't know what to do. And she looked at me, and she said, Solve the problem. And she walked away. And I said, Don't teach her, talk me. It's quite interesting where we teach in the province of Ontario. As seventh grade teachers, I find us trying to sort of unravel teaching to the test in September. Here in the province of Ontario, our students write a standardized test at the end of sixth grade. So their experience at the end of sixth grade is being taught to the test, pulling down on the anchor charts, putting that technology away, and quite often being bribed with candy. Then they go home for the summer and they come back to school and they see us in September. So only about two school weeks later, pull the summer aside, we find our seventh grade students wanting to be spoon-fed. Spoon fed. They don't want to take risks. They don't want to try new things. They want to be told what to do so they can go and get the grade. Well, that's quite contradictory to the narrative of what computer science is all about, rooted in creativity and collaboration and building on new ideas and engaging in emerging technologies further. I sat down on the couch and I thought, what would my students do in this, in this situation? We talk a lot about inquiry-based learning where I'm from. Well, here's an open-ended project. How in the heck are we going to get the keys out of the vehicle? Let's say it's parked in the driveway or parked in the school parking lot. Well, most of my students are going to say break the window, but that's not an option for me teaching in January in Ontario, Canada, because it is incredibly cold. Just going to quickly turn my camera off. My microphone's still on? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, Brian. Thanks. All right, we're going to go straight. We're going to go straight to audio. Thank you for that. Awesome. So, and so I locked my keys in the vehicle. And I thought, what would my students do? So I sat down on the couch and I thought, okay, now consider the context. I'm a part of a very, very large, large community of people who are connected to the internet. I got on a computer and I decided to bang how to break into a Mazda B4000 pickup truck. Actually, I Googled it, but I was recently giving this talk at the Microsoft office in Seattle and I thought I better swap out that Google slide if I want to be invited back to tour the Minecraft facility. So I threw the big slide in. How do I break into a Mazda B4000 pickup truck? And I realized there was a whole series of videos based on make, based on model, based on color. But this video... This video really jumped out at me. You see, here I am sitting on my couch all alone in context, but I realized I am a part of a much larger community. A community of 143,000 people that also Googled how to break into a Ford Ranger and watched this video. Today, we're going to show you how to unlock a Ford Ranger. It's locked. Your keys are in there. 
And, and uh, what you want to do is take a little tool like this, make a little hook on it about, I don't know, an inch, inch and a half. Okay, so come over to your door and there's a little, uh... okay, so there's the two holes and you got to pick one, probably this one on the right, get your little hook in there. Probably. So now what we're going to do is... Now you recognize the there's, there's the two little... people here. We're, we're collaborating. One mm, person has to hold the camera. Door lock. Door lock. Yeah, the oh, lock. You got your feedback. And, and you can see it moving. Oh, come on. Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? I wouldn't have showed you the video if he didn't. Let's go, my friend. Save me $300 on CAA. And voila. Yeah. Out. And you're open. Get L your keys. Listen for the next step. And uh, don't do that again. Don't do that again. Well, listen here, my two friends. You two have created a student product outside of school hours. So what I love about this video is I have a media, an oral, a reading, and a writing curriculum underneath my language arts document here in the province of Ontario. You might call it ELA. And in media, we are to create media using oral communication. And when I first saw this video, I was actually teaching procedural writing in my seventh grade ELA class. And I remember my students writing the procedure on how to make toast. I was bored. They were bored. But the goal was to teach sequential steps first, then, next, finally. I remember driving home one day with a pile of pieces of writing long before the Google Cloud or any kind of cloud space platform. And I had all these paper copies. And I remember thinking, I don't want to assess these. I don't want to evaluate these. They're full of spelling mistakes. Nobody's engaged. And I stumbled upon this video. And what I love about the video is not only did they create the media content using their oral communication, they actually wrote the transcript in the YouTube video itself. So now we have a piece of writing. We have a student product created by two individuals who did so on their own time and uploaded it to YouTube. And guess how many spelling mistakes were actually in the transcript on that YouTube channel? You guessed it, zero, because they published it in an authentic context. But they did this without being asked to do so on their own time. So now we have a student product that we can talk about in terms of assessment and evaluation. I can dissect all of my curriculum in my ELA language arts document around this video. I can say 143,000 hits. Let's talk about data management and bias and numeracy. And let's get on Google Street View and figure out where some of these hits came from. You got a referral from Sri Lanka? Let's go look at that country and let's turn on Street View and let's make inferences about their culture and their traditions and the way they live. All of this pulled from some simple video created by two people who probably locked keys in their vehicle at one time. At the bottom of the transcript on the YouTube channel, it said, you'll be able to do this in 42 seconds. And I'm a bit of a gamer, so I took that as a challenge. I yelled at my wife, honey, I got this. I grabbed my phone, and I went outside. Feel free to throw an arbitrary number in the chat. How long do you think it took me to actually break into my vehicle that first time through? We have a 10 minutes guess so far, Brian. Oh, that's, <laughs> Five that's minutes. Fine. That's kind. I'll take 10 minutes. No, <laughs> 56 seconds, and I wasn't happy with that, so I locked my keys back in the truck. And I tried again. A bit of a satire. I hope you're chuckling at home. But let's dissect this for a second. Coding is sequential language. Coding executes one line at a time. Just like writing a procedure. Or just like learning to serve a volleyball. Or just like learning to do a layup. Or in this case, just like learning how to break into my vehicle. But the challenge I have for you is, they told me I could do it in 42 seconds. And it took me 56 seconds. So by definition, did I fail? Or because I was given an opportunity and I was able to do it in the time they told me I could, did I demonstrate some level of mastery? I put that out there because I want to challenge your thinking around grades, especially in elementary school, assigning numerical values to conversations and, and student work when we're trying to encourage kids to take risks and embrace failure. Currently, most of us live and work in a system in which failure is punished, and there's far too much risk in not getting the grade. In my first year as an educator around 2003, 
I found myself in a seventh grade classroom and a group of boys approached me and said, Mr. A, you study computer science? So yeah, boys, I did. <laughs> they said, why are you a teacher? <laughs> of course, I laughed. I thought, I don't know, July, August. No, I'm just kidding. It's because I want to engage with young people and encourage them to follow their passions and be creative. And they say, yeah, 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 whatever. Can you show us how to make a game? Now, in those days, trying to get a teaching job where I'm from was rather difficult. And it was about who you knew more so than what you knew. So I actually marched down to the principal's office. After all, that principal was going to go up for mat, up to bat for me the following summer to help me get a permanent position. I was only covering a maternity leave from spring break through June. I walked down to the office. I said, Mr. Moore, I'm going to make a coding club. He said, what the heck is a coding club? I said, don't worry about it. I'm going to put it on my resume. And you're going to tell everybody about it at staffing in July. I thought I was quite progressive, you know, building a coding club in the early 2000s. And I'll get more to that story later because I actually didn't start the first, you know, coding club movement, so to speak, that we see all across our globe today. Coding clubs actually started in the 1950s and the 1960s. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the infamous pooping baby game. These boys said to me, we're going to shoot poop missiles at the city and your job in the game is to essentially save the city. <laughs> in hindsight, I wish I had encouraged more females to come to my coding club. We have a saying at our school, it's okay to be where you are. It's not okay to stay there. And that's where I was. But technology, computer science, engineering, still very, very, very male dominated. And we need to include and encourage our young females to also enter into these professions, particularly at a very young age. I remember sitting beside these boys and they said, have you ever heard of Scratch? I said, no, no, I haven't. Well, in 2003, Scratch was an install. It didn't run in the browser like it does today. But in 2003, where I'm from, social media was blocked. MySpace, Twitter was just starting, Facebook, YouTube was blocked. In fact, YouTube's still blocked in a lot of districts across the globe. And our USB ports were also blocked. We were indirectly sending a message to our young people that we didn't trust them, but the reality was we didn't trust the USB devices to accidentally upload any kind of virus. We had to download Scratch and put it on USBs, and then we had to actually install it onto our computer systems. And I remember looking at these boys, and I said, boys, do you think you can beat the USB firewall? Man, they looked at me and they said, Mr. A, can you beat the installation privileges firewall? <laughs> we sort of nodded in unison. We closed the door. We covered that little piece of glass in the door with chart paper that we found so nobody could see what it is we were actually doing. And we went about making a train in the computer lab and we installed Scratch and we hid the icon so our IT department didn't know what we were up to. Now, keep in mind, I was trying to get a job while teaching young people how to break all the IT rules book and allowing them to make a game about a baby that shoots poop missiles at the city. Wouldn't you know, I got hired permanent <laughs> that following fall. And I'm not sure if the baby is the reason, but the background to this story is what is of utmost importance. This experience in my first year of teaching, I like to say it changed my pedagogy, but I didn't have one. In fact, I'm still not even sure how to evaluate this experience. You see, this was created in the scratch space. And I said to them, boys, how are you making that baby move to the right side of the screen? They said, Mr. A, it's so simple. When green flag clicked, change X by one. So I pulled those blocks out into Scratch. When green flag clicked, change X by one. And, and I ran the program. And wouldn't you know, the baby went plunk, one unit to the right. And I said, boys, how did you make the baby go to the right forever? And the second I said that, I thought, oh, my goodness, the word forever. I took an entire course on looping in third year university. Are these boys going to tell me I have to put it in a loop? And sure enough, they said, Mr. A, you have to put it in a forever loop. Well, here I am, 30,000 Canadian dollars in student loans, hanging out with 12-year-olds who are self-taught coders learning about loops, not two years after I graduated from computer science. I said, boys, how did you make the baby go backwards now that I have it going all the way to the right side of the screen? I don't see a turnaround block. They said, Mr. A, you are killing us. 
well, our students are always 20 steps ahead, so that didn't surprise me. They said when it touches the side of the screen, you have to make the baby go all the way to the left by changing its X value to a minus one. In other words, forever change X by minus one. And I did that. And sure enough, the baby was going back and forth across this grid. I said, now tell me about the poop missile algorithm. And I still chuckle when I say that poop missile algorithm. They said, Mr. A, the poop. Well, we, we hide its costume so it doesn't look to be on the screen. And then we show it randomly at the baby's location and we shoot it to the bottom. At that point, I realized I have a lot to learn. I still have a lot to learn. But in terms of assessment and evaluation, let me paraphrase this experience. I have a handful of boys working in an after-school club, informal learning space, engaging with me, still at school, but outside of school hours. I never want to label students or put students in a box, but consider the profile of these kids. They, they weren't on the basketball court. They'd be rather hanging out with me and doing really cool, fun, nerdy, geeky stuff that I love. I said, boys, let me paraphrase what you've got going on here. You have a baby at a, posi uh, a constant positive Y position translating back and forth. The baby reflects itself when it touches the perimeter of the screen. The baby moves by changing its value from positive X to minus X. The poop missile hidden by default plots itself at the baby's actual XY location randomly, which is a little bit of probability, and then translates to the bottom of the screen with a forever change Y by negative one. For every poop missile shot and for every poop missile caught with that paddle, you get a point. Points get stored in variables. As the points get higher, the poop gets faster. <sighs> They literally said, yeah, that's about it. And in my mind, I thought, holy S-H-I-T, pun intended. You just did the entire strand of geometry without any explicit teaching. I remember sitting there that moment going, everything I learned in teacher's college is wrong. These boys just demonstrated mastery in geometry. I can ask them the integer signs in quadrant three, and they can tell me X is negative, and so is Y. I went home that night. I said, honey, I have a problem. And she said, I know. I said, no, you don't understand. I have all this grid paper photocopied ready to go for tomorrow's geometry lesson. But my lesson, as good as it might be, only focuses on one, maybe two curriculum expectations. These boys did the entire strand of geometry. They started talking about variables as placeholders and numbers in math. And they were including probability in this game. How do I evaluate this? Do I have to evaluate this? Well, of course I do. Well, where I'm from, the province of Ontario, we have a beautiful document that says our educators are allowed to assign a numerical grade based on observation, conversation, and student product. But quite often as we go up the grade, that student product carries a lot more weight. And those isolated testing environments also carry a lot more weight. Now, if I had pulled these boys out of this club and put them in a testing environment about geometry, I don't think they would have done nearly as well. But here they are in an authentic context, after school, learning about geometry by programming, learning about probability by programming, learning about variables by programming. You know, if you can learn to code, you can code to learn. And this is a perfect example of such. It was an authentic context that made geometry completely relevant to them. And this was an experience I had in my very first year in an after school coding club. And it set me on the path to expose as many kids to so principles of computer science as I can. Because the same thing happened to me when I was in high school. So in grade 10, Mrs. Boudreau let me uh, create this website project that nobody had ever done before while other students were making this poster. And the principal found out about it. And the principal actually asked me if I would make the first ever Harrow District High School website. So by the time I graduated high school, I had a paid you know, web portfolio, which led me to go into computer science just because of that one, that one choice she let me make. What would you do if you saw her right now? How are you? I still talk to Mrs. Boudreaux, and I'm really proud of that experience. I politely was poking fun at Microsoft earlier, but Microsoft Canada set up this little interaction. I was flown to Toronto, and she was, but I didn't know. And she was behind the wall, and they asked me to describe everything I loved about Mrs. Boudreaux. And it's funny because, you know, 25 years later, I wasn't describing the content. I wasn't describing the curriculum. I was describing her character. 
She challenged me. She inspired me. She made me feel good about myself. She believed in me. That's what I remember most about Mrs. Boudreaux. And that's what I hope the boys remember about me during that coding club experience. After I went home that day, I decided to get on the internet and try and figure out where the heck Scratch comes from. Scratch is that one coding tool that was built by teachers for teachers. So it gives us peace of mind with student data. I started learning about Reggio Emilia and, and Loris Malaguzzi, you know, the city throughout the on these three bullets. World War II was a long time ago. But imagine giving students control over the direction of their learning. Imagine letting students learn through experiences of touching, moving, listening, and observing. But most importantly, and again, as we go up through the grades, this last bullet gets less and less. We must provide our students with endless ways and opportunities to express themselves. My former school district still to this day has an exam policy in place. Again, we always talk about teaching for more school. We do exams because they'll need exams next year. We give grades because they'll need grades next year. But as we've learned in the last two years, the world changes overnight. I remember reading more about Reggio Emilia, and I came across Jean Piaget, and I thought, ah, I remember Piaget. I took a third-year psychology course in university to meet girls because there were none in computer science. I remember reading about constructivist learning. I remember reading about hands-on learning in a textbook. And I remember having to apply what I read, what I thought I understood about hands-on learning by reading it in a textbook and applying it to situations on a multiple choice test. But those situations didn't mean anything to me. I didn't have any prior knowledge about those experiences. So here I am trying to apply my knowledge of what I've read in a textbook about hands-on learning to situations on a multiple choice test that I've never engaged in. I remember getting a C minus in the course. And at the time I thought, boy, that was hard. Today, Brian, today teacher in me says, no, that assessment wasn't accurate. First of all, you made me read about hands-on learning and then apply it to situations that were so far out of context. I had no idea how, where to even begin. Plus I was never trained how to take a multiple choice test. We talk a lot about preparing kids for the next. If test taking is a skill, it needs to be taught in isolation, perhaps. I remember reading this quote, no one understands my ideas as well as Papert. And I thought, I have to meet this Seymour Papert character. I soon learned that Seymour Papert was a student of Piaget. He studied under that constructivist learning model. And I remember reading this quote, the role of the educators to create the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. And the quote stuck out to me for a lot of reasons. Perhaps most importantly, this quote was said or written before the internet. This is not a modern day quote. This is not Seymour Papert predicting an era of access. This is Seymour Papert prior to a world of access, suggesting that classrooms still need to be incubators for startups and inventions. He challenged schools and computer labs and said things like, we don't go to the pencil factory to use that tool for 40 minutes on a weekly basis. So as long as you use technology as an event, it will never be truly utilized as it should be in practice. I remember thinking this is amazing because now we have decades of research about project-based learning as we call it today, beginning with Piaget's constructivist learning and moving forward to Seymour Papert. A fun fact that not a lot of people know the Scratch team today studied under Seymour Papert. Makey Makey and Little Bits were both startups that came under the Scratch team. So now we have decades upon decades of pedagogical research about hands-on learning with physical computing. What I love about Seymour Papert and his body of work is he was a mathematician who encouraged mistakes in math, a subject area traditionally scored based on a quantity of correct answers. We like to talk about collaboration being a 21st century fluency. Here's a video from the 70s where kids have to collaborate because somebody has to hold the cable. But what's unique about this particular video, this isn't about learning to code. This isn't even about coding to learn. It's about coding to learn mathematics. They're doing geometry. They're changing variables. They're making spiral art, you know, hashtag steam, not STEM. They're trying to replicate what other students were doing. 
and they haven't touched a textbook. They're getting immediate feedback from the environment, which is very much a Reggio Emilia theme. And if we use technology as that third teacher, it frees up our own time to conference with other students who might need it. Seymour Papert and his team created the first block-based coding language called Logo around 1968. This was the first quote-unquote block-based coding language used in schools. And it wasn't a tool to learn to code. It was a tool to code to learn in 2D geometry. And let's say hypothetically now I'm going to paint or tape an equilateral triangle on the floor of my classroom. And I'm going to have students walk that triangle and use their steps as a unit of measure. And there's a reason steps is the unit of measure in the Scratch platform. Let's say I've taped a triangle down now and it's equilateral and I'm going to have some diagnostic assessment with my students. What's perimeter? I hope they tell me they're going to walk on the tape. What's area? I hope they tell me it's the tiles inside of the tape. Great. Now, my friend over here, Johnny, why don't you come up? And why don't you walk the first leg of this triangle and tell me how many steps it is? And of course, little Johnny is walking the first leg of the triangle. We've got now a kinesthetic math experience. I've got students up and moving and exploring perimeter, perimeter using their own feet. He says, 11. Okay, Johnny, now what's the perimeter? Of course, Johnny thinks for a second. 11 plus 11 plus 11. 33! And of course, Seymour Papper says, yes, that's correct. Great. Is there another student in the room that came up with 33 but used a different strategy? Now, the goal here while teaching about math is also to show that there's more than one way to solve a problem. And that gives us an opportunity to discuss efficiency, particularly in a computer science makerspace kind of experience. Another student might say, well, 11 times 3 is also 33. And because it's an equilateral triangle, the side lengths are all the same. That's correct. Great. Okay, now listen, Johnny. I need you to go and get on the computer and draw the triangle to scale using your steps. The first block, of course, is going to be forward. We can't change the, the English words. We can only change the numerical values. So I want you to go on the computer. I want you to do forward 11. Of course, Johnny gets on the computer and hits forward 11 and, and runs the program. And sure enough, the turtle draws a straight line. It's working. Mr. Pappert says, now listen, we're not dealing with right angle triangles, so it, it can't possibly be a right 90. What do you think that angle is going to be? And without hesitation, Johnny says, 60. And I think a lot of you at home are probably thinking the same. Mr. Pappert says, I don't know, but that's the beauty of these programs. We get to try and try again if it doesn't work. So go ahead and try. Johnny puts forward 11, right 60 runs the program, and it does not look like it should. It does not look like the triangle on the floor. Mr. Pappert says, well, that's strange. After all, uh, we are dealing with equilateral triangles, and the sum of three angles in any triangle is 180 degrees, and if these three are all the same, they must be 60. But this is actually a part of his lesson. This is his teaching practice now. He says, I don't know, Johnny. Why don't you go get back on that triangle and, and try that again? So Johnny walks back to the triangle that's taped on the floor. And he walks the first leg and he says, yeah, it's still 11. And Mr. Pappert says, okay, great. Well, let's, let's turn your body now. And as Johnny begins to spin, Mr. Pappert says, now hold on a second. Did you turn your body acute or obtuse? Well, I don't know what that means. Was it less than 90 or was it bigger than 90? And of course, little Johnny's looking at the floor and he says, you know, I, th I think I actually turned bigger than 90. You know, that wooden protractor we all still have in our classroom closets that we used to use on the chalkboard and we don't know what to do with them, but we can't bear to throw them out. They would get out that protractor and they would put it down on the floor. And they would say, how big was that turn? And just by looking at the floor, they realized together, you have to turn your body 120 degrees in order to construct a 60 degree angle because there's 180 degrees in a straight line and 360 degrees in one full rotation. So what I love about this activity is we encourage students to try. We encourage students to make mistakes. 
we encourage students to learn from said mistakes, change variables, and try again. And we didn't touch a single textbook, and we didn't touch a single worksheet. But more powerful than that, supplementary angles, exterior angles, that's far beyond Johnny's curriculum. He's learning about curriculum far beyond the grade level he's in because he's engaged in this kind of an experience. Those things taught me that in a world that changes overnight, the only strategy guaranteed to fail is not trying something new. And a lot of this comes back to how we build the cultures and communities in our own classrooms. A very, very similar experience happened to me recently. I was teaching an eighth grade math class and the Canadian penny went away. We still have the Canadian penny in circulation. Our country just doesn't make or produce the penny anymore because it takes more than one cent to produce a one cent coin. These students in their eighth grade year, that's their last year of elementary school where I live before they graduate to high school. So I thought it would be a wonderful, wonderful memento to buy them all that penny. The penny stamped the last year it was minted, the year they graduated from eighth grade. Truth is, we were studying probability. It happened to be April 1st, and I was following a numeracy framework, as my district told me to do. I remember giving every student in my class a penny, and I said, get out a piece of paper and flip a coin and make a T-chart. And I want you to tally if you got heads or tails. Now, I had 24 students in my class, so in theory, 12 should have got heads and 12 should have got tails. After all, that's my theoretical probability that I'm supposed to teach to 12 and 13 year olds. And somehow I'm supposed to show them that the more times I flip this coin, the closer the data set gets to 50 50. Well, it's nearly impossible to flip a coin hundreds of times in an isolated 40 minute math class. It's unfortunate that we let time and bells dictate when learning begins and when learning stops. I remember turning on the smart board and saying, all right, we're going to flip this penny 50 times. I remember turning on the radio. I was feeling very progressive. I opened my classroom door. I remember walking to the very first table, and there was two girls sitting there who were reading books. And I said, girls, like, what are you up to? What, what do you think is going to happen if you flip this penny? And I remember them saying, Miss Dre, we just want to read. You've probably found a student just like that in your class. And it's like, wow, I really need you to do this math, but... Uh, there's probably more value in that book. It's way thicker than any book I've ever read. What do you think would happen if you flipped the penny 50 times? And I remember Rebecca saying to me, well, Mr. A, it might be 25, 25. It might be 23, 27. But I tell you one thing, if I perform this experiment 50 times and I put the data set aside and then I grabbed a Canadian quarter and I flipped it a hundred times, chances are that data set is closer to 50, 50 because I performed the experiment twice as many times i remember looking at them going ah uh, speechless uh, uh uh 93 and i walked over to the next table and there's a kid with a ziploc bag he's like mr a there's no more pennies i want all these pennies i'm collecting pennies and in my peripheral i can see another kid whipping a penny and i'm like i have to do an accident report this went way better in the teacher's college guidebook i read on my planning time not 15 minutes later i had to turn off the radio i lost complete control of the lesson it was far too loud I had to close the door. I sat down at my desk, not ready to admit I had failed. Remember, it's okay to be where you are. It's not okay to stay there. I could have used this as an opportunity to model the process of failure and being vulnerable in front of my students, but that's not where I was in my own teaching philosophy. I had to be right, and I had to be perfect all the time. I remember staring at that clock going, this is what it feels like to hope that recess can come just any sooner, any sooner, any sooner. I remember Rebecca putting up her hand saying, Mr. A, can I go read in the hall? It's way too loud in here. I remember saying, Rebecca, yeah, fine, but write a summary so I know what book you're reading. You know, when the bell finally rang for us students to go out for recess, Gavin came up to me. Gavin was a great student, well-behaved, athletic has a giant student record, identified with a learning disability in third grade, has an IEP that follows him around wherever he goes. He knows it. He said, Mr. Ray, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to make you an app so you can teach that better next year. And of course, in that moment, I remember thinking, Gavin, go sit down before I choke you. But I said, what do you got? Talk to me. He said, well, in Scratch, Mr. A, under the operators, the green code block, there's a pick random. I said, yeah. 
well, if I pick a random number between zero and one and I say zero is heads and one is tails, I'm going to make a simulated coin flipper. I remember looking at him and thinking, that is brilliant, IEP. When was the last time we retested you? He says, can I work on it in math class? I said, heck, yeah, you can. And this was a student now in his 10th year of elementary school. See, our students go JK, SK, and then one through eight. In his 10th year of elementary school, Gavin doesn't really do homework. Gavin does the game of school well enough so that he can lead the basketball team after school. Gavin knows how to stay out of trouble so he can play sports, and he knows bare minimum and bare maximum that'll get him through the school day just by simply playing the game of school. So when he said to me, can I work on it in math class? I was over the moon. Joy, of course you can. A few days go by, and he says, Mr. A, it's done and it works. We put it up on the smart board. And he said, go ahead and click on that green flag. So I went over to the right side of the screen. I went over to the right side of the screen, and I flipped that coin. And I want you to look at the variables on the left side of the screen. I said, holy smokes, Gavin, that's amazing. It actually worked. I said, why did you flip the coin? And he said, well, if I downloaded a coin flipper from the app store and it didn't flip, I would delete it. Well, that reminded me of my purpose and audience curriculum in my language arts document. When we're writing stories, we have to think about who we're writing them for. Well, it's the same thing in the design thinking process. If we're solving problems for people, we need to know what the problem is and what they need as a solution before we can even begin the design part. He says, yeah, Mr. A, I'm using this as a teachable moment. Whatever, Mr. A, go ahead and click the flag again. And I actually clicked on it five times. I went, wow, it flipped twice. We're percent one T. Oh, we're one third, two thirds now. Oh, my goodness, we're 50-50 after four flips. And I stopped after five flips. Because as we know, in theory, flipping a coin should be 50-50. But when you flip one coin once, three times, five times, seven times, it's never 50-50. And I said, Gavin, we have a bug. He said, what do you mean? I said, this, shouldn't it be 50-50? And Gavin looked at me and he said, no, Mr. A, this is the experiment. So now here I am remembering the pooping baby from 15 years prior. Here I am standing in front of a 12-year-old identified with a learning disability who self-taught coder who made me a probability simulator using Scratch. And he knew the difference now between experimental and theoretical probability. So much so, I said, Gavin, what is the turbo button in the bottom right corner? <laughs> he said, Miss Ray, you remember that day you said you wanted to choke me? I said, Gavin, I never said that. Rebecca said, yeah, you did. We all heard you. I said, you keep talking. You're going to get a substitute teacher for the rest of the year. So what did you do? He said, I took all my code and I put it in a loop. What I love about this story is we're still staring at the 20% the tip of the iceberg. We don't see the 80%. That's where we can play buzzword bingo, growth mindset, resiliency, initiative, collaboration, rigor, all the soft skills, if you will. And I'm using air quotes. I know you can't see me. All the soft skills that went into creating this student product. Those are the skills that are going to make Gavin incredibly successful in life. Not suggesting this student product is not as successful but if this was an exam experience, this product would carry far too much weight. He said, Mr. A, I put all my code in a loop. So what did you learn, Gavin? Turns out, Mr. A, your theory is right. I said, what theory is that, Gavin? He said, the law of large numbers, if you flip a coin a million times, it is 50-50 to some nth decimal place. I said, what's going to happen if I click the button? He said, Mr. A, it's going to ask you to enter a really big number. I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to flip it a million times. And as you can imagine, I was all for it. We entered an incredibly large number. At this point, he said, Mr. A, I had to turn off the animation. It made the computer laggy, but keep your eyes on the numbers because you're going to see the law of large numbers happen in real time. I said, the law of large numbers, that's high school math. Gavin, you're in eighth grade with an IEP and a learning disability. And here I am staring at an app created by a 12-year-old who did so without any explicit teaching to demonstrate mastery of theoretical and experimental probability while using variables, which is a component of algebra. And by flipping a coin, by changing its Y position, we're using principles of geometry to create that animation. 
I don't know how else to make my tasks as any more rich and engaging as something like this. But more importantly than this experience is Gavin taught me all students can achieve if given a fair chance. And technology, when implemented properly, can be a vehicle used to unlock human potential. My name is Brian Aspinall. Please reach out on Twitter. Find me on Instagram. Thank you so much for joining all of us tonight and being here with you. It's always a pleasure for me to share Gavin's story. He would be forever proud to know more people have heard it. Thank you so much, Brian, for sharing your expertise on computer science, all of those incredible stories. So everyone, stay with us. We still have a lot of exciting things coming. And so as Brian just showed you, computer science is not just coding or computer literacy. It is all of these things that you see. Engaging with tech tools in the classroom, pattern recognition, algorithmic thinking, digital citizenship, which I saw someone call out in the chat earlier, data literacy, and so much more. And you're all here because you understand like we do that students need computer science skills to navigate and thrive in today's digital world. Now, I saw a lot of people sharing their suggestions of how they're introducing computer science in their classrooms. So we are so excited to be able to share some more ideas um, and be able to, to share some ready to teach computer science lessons with you today that are inside of Seesaw. So in your activity libraries in Seesaw, you now have a Seesaw Lessons Library. Now, what are Seesaw Lessons? Lessons are a school or district subscription to high quality standards aligned learning experiences right in Seesaw. However, it's super great to say that we do have five free collections that are available right now to anyone in Seesaw um, and schools and districts can purchase access to the rest of the collections. Now, within all of these collections, there are five collections that support teachers with integrating computer science into the, their classrooms. And these Seesaw lessons allow everyday teachers to teach computer science concepts with confidence and a sense of joy without having to become an expert. And with Seesaw lessons, students are going to engage in real world computer science concepts through both hands-on and digital activities, like some of those amazing uh, examples of hands-on computer science activities that Brian shared earlier. Seesaw lessons provide the perfect first exposure to computer science in order to scaffold the skills into other platforms. And everything you all need, everything teachers need for rigorous engaging lessons is built right into each collection. There's printable lesson plans that empower you as a teacher to provide step-by-step -step guidance and model computer science skills for, their, for your students. I know when I was a teacher, I was not a computer science expert. So those lesson plans are definitely something I relied on. So today we're gonna highlight just two of the computer science collections that are available in, available in CSAB. Although you will leave this session with lessons from all five of the computer science collections. So let's start with computational thinking. This collection will invite students to learn about and practice the pillars of computational thinking, decomposition, algorithmic thinking, and pattern recognition. These cognitive skills are the foundation for future learning in computer science. Students will practice their new school skills by joining Robot, one of our lessons characters, in an interactive storybook with fun, authentic, cross-curricular activities. So let's go ahead and jump into a computational thinking lesson. Get that up and shared. And so this is called, this lesson is Robot Decomposes Dressing for Cold Weather. And our computational thinking lessons are designed to be completed in the sequence that they appear in Seesaw. Now, as a teacher, what you're looking at right now, I have already assigned the first lesson in the decomposition pillar to my students. I'm logged in as a student so that we can go through this lesson together. This lesson starts with Robot prompting students to learn with him about decomposi decomposition. He says, hi friends, Robot here. Let's watch Rainbow Bear and Turtle teach us about decomposition. So next, watch that instructional video as a class in order to learn the needed content knowledge to complete the activities in all of the lessons about decomposition. So let's take a look. 
Sophia, where were we? Whoa. Hey, turtle. Hey, Rebo Bear. I'm going to go outside and play. Want to join me? Oh, you bet. Oh, 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 wait. Wait a second, turtle. Oh, come on. Where do you think you're going? Oh, outside to play with you, oh. silly. Well, not just like that, you're not. It's wintertime and it's snowing hard outside. Wait, did you say snow? Uh, oh, yeah, it's snowing big time outside. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen snow in so long. Oh. Oh, I have so many clothes in my closet. I can't even remember how I'm supposed to dress when it snows. Ah! Oh. What will I wear oh. to stay warm? Whoa, that's a big problem. Let's use decomposition to help us solve it together. Uh, decomp what? Decomposition. Decomposition is when you break down something big into smaller parts. Oh. When you break down something big, it makes it easier to solve. Uh. So I'm going to pause there, but the video continues, and I love all the love for Rainbow Bear and Turtle in the chat. Yes, they are incredible characters that continue to teach students and model how to use um, decomposition in this particular instance. Now, on the next page, Robot presents a problem he has, as you can see, and he invites students to help him solve it. In this case, the problem is Robot is not dressed for the cold, and students need to use decomposition to break the problem into smaller parts. As we continue on to page three, Robot then invites the class to think about smaller parts of the problem. As a teacher, you can invite students to stand up together, point out different parts of their body that need to be covered when they go outside. This sparks whole class conversations that allows for students to share their opinions and add on to each other's ideas, which is also a really important skill. So now that students have broken robots problem into smaller parts, their hard work is acknowledged here. It says, you just used decomposition. You broke my big problem into smaller parts. Now let's solve each smaller part. Do you see anything you could move to keep my head warm? Now, if this is on a smart board, you can move it yourself or have a student come up and move that beanie to cover robots head. On page five of this lesson, students then get to put their understanding of decomposition to work. You could have students complete this on their own, or again, if you're, you know, whole class, the students are sitting on the rug, you can have students come up to your computer or the smart board and drag an item onto robot and complete the sentence stem on the bottom where it says, I used a blank to keep blank warm. So I'm going to drag these mittens onto robot and I'm going to say, I used a mitten to keep my hands warm. And then finally, to complete the activity, students are going to relate decomposition to their own lives. Students take a photo of themselves in Seesaw just by tapping on this camera button right here, tapping on photo. There we go. Of course, you can resize it. And then students are prompted to use the drawing tools to draw what clothes they would wear depending on where they live. So I live very far from the beach in Colorado. So the first thing I thought of is the beach because I wish I was there right now. So if students live near the beach, they could use decomposition to get ready for a hot day by the water uh, with a hat. So they can, you know, select this tool. I'm going to select a, a yellow sun hat that's going to go over my head, color it in. I can't forget those pink sunglasses. Need to protect my eyes. Students continue by, you know, using any of the drawing tools to add maybe a bathing suit, some sandals. And then students use the microphone right here, top right here, to share how decomposition, um, they used it to get ready. So they're going to start recording. They can record, talk about themselves and what they used, how the hat and the sunglasses are going to help them. And then they'll just tap that green done button when they are done. Of course, then we want to make sure students check or tap on that green check one more time. So computational thinking builds the cognitive skills that are the foundation for future learning in computer science. Now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Cheryl to highlight the next lessons, um, the next lesson collection. Take it away, Cheryl. Thanks, Allie. So the next collection we're gonna look at today is Mission Code. This collection is designed to help you and your students build computer science and computational thinking skills in age-appropriate ways. Students will visually code, 
problem solve and explain their problem solving programming decisions as secret agents. And basically, they will be helping save robots from impending doom. Every lesson is designed in an exciting narrative format uh, using video, which makes the CS content accessible to all students as well as you, regardless of experience with computer science. Each mission concludes with an opportunity for students to practice coding skills through unplugged, that means off the device, partner activities. And this collection is for third through fifth grade, but could be assigned to students that have prior experience with coding in K2 and can also be um, assigned asynchronously for the older learners. But don't worry, we are also developing a K2 coding collection, which will be available very, very soon. But let's take a look at the lesson. So the first one we're gonna walk through is called uh, RoboDog and the Phone. And hopefully it'll load for us, perfect. Welcome agents to Mission Code. Today, you and your students will embark on a mission to learn foundational computer science skills through digital and hands-on learning activities. First, you will get to view your intro mission that debriefs what your task is for today. And I'm gonna play just a little bit of it for you. And in this secret spy intro video, you and your students will learn key vocabulary essential to engage in the mission, as well as view real world examples. Identity scan, access granted, system startup. We have an important mission for you today, agent. In order to complete this mission, you must learn the secret word. The secret word is code. Check out this secure video file to learn more about the secret word code. Code is directions for computers and computers do lots of things. Computers help us do things faster. They help us do things that are repetitive. They make it possible for us so after learning the key essential vocabulary, students will then get their briefing of how to begin their mission. So as a whole class or independently, you can have students watch this or play it whole class. And we'll just watch a portion of it today. Keyword. All right, are you ready for your mission? Here we go. Is to help RoboDog. RoboDog needs to turn off the phone before it rings and wakes the kitties. Write code or directions for RoboDog to get to the phone in time. Watch out for the sleeping kitties. You do not want to wake them. <laughs> Drag arrows onto the grid to show RoboDog the way. Test your code by moving RoboDog along the arrows to make sure the code works. <laughs> If you make a mistake, try again. So after students watch the modeling video, excuse me, they will then as a whole class or independently drag arrows onto the grid to move RoboDog past the sleeping kitties to the bone. And what's really neat about this grid is there isn't just one way to get to the outcome. So at the end, students are practicing computational thinking skills, sorry if you hear my actual dog outside, by looking at different solutions and assessing, hmm, which way is the most efficient way to get to the bone? And they can click the mic here to share which different strategy uses the fewest arrows. Now, every single mission code lesson has an unplugged partner activity and we'll watch a portion of this video. Hi, Vid. Remember, we need to move quietly like a spy so no one will catch us. Move two steps to the right. One, two. Move three steps forward. One, two, three. Good. Keep moving forward. Three more steps. One, two, three. Now move three steps that way. One, two, three. Now look down. Oh, I think I see something. Is the secret object a unicorn? Yep. So students will practice pair programming with hands-on collaborative um, activities such as this one that can be played at home or school. Now what's really great about 
mission code is students will reflect and explain their programming decisions using any of the seesaw tools. And this is a really great way to close the learning loop and show families what students are learning about computer science as well. And for digital extension, all of these materials can be printed and kept at centers for your students to do unplugged. Students, of course, at the end of every single mission will celebrate with collectible digital and physical badges and a fun video. You can also extend the learning digitally with another partner activity where they can compose the grid, hand the device to a partner or work with a partner, and the second person will direct the first person of how to get RoboDog to the new place of the bone phone. And I'm gonna give you a sneak peek at what we're developing for loops using Scratch. And this is gonna be available to you shortly um, in the fall. So we start off on Seesaw, Seesaw only with RoboClock. And what students are doing is investigating music. They can click on each audio button and circle the repeated ones. You might have identified that song. What they are doing is then replacing the notes with loops. Now, what does that look like for Scratch? Well, students can watch a video that goes step-by-step step of how to use each of the blocks in the block-based programming Scratch software. And then they're doing the same thing they did on Seesaw. They are grabbing the sound blocks and moving it into loops to create music. Awesome, and this is just a sneak peek of what you're going to get shortly in the fall. Back to you, Allie. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Now I'm looking at the clock. I know we're almost at our time, but hang with us if you're able to. We're gonna have Brian back here in just a minute to answer one or two questions as well as share those lessons and you'll have that opportunity to win his book. So. If you want to learn more about another computer science collection, our digital citizenship collection, actually, uh, we really encourage you to join us on May 12th when Seesaw's Chris Shiner is going to walk us through this curriculum and why it's so, so, so important for students to be safe, kind, and res responsible when online. We will drop the link to register in the chat. We just did. Thank you, as well as in the handouts um, tab for you both spots. So one more thing as promised, here is the handout with the links to the 10 free Seesaw lessons, two for each collection um, from our computer science collections. Simply tap the link and save it to your My Library. Again, this is going to be in the handout tab next to your chat and Q&A tab. Um, it also will come in your follow-up email in case you miss it there. Now, if you need more basics on how to use Seesaw, really encourage you to check out our training page at web.seesaw.me forward slash training. And again, you will find both of these links in the handouts tab and you'll receive it in your follow-up email. So as we wrap up today, we really encourage you to think about how you can incorporate computer science into your classroom using the Seesaw lessons we have provided. We encourage you to explore the computer science Seesaw lessons collections and test them out in your classroom to see how you can support students to navigate and thrive in today's digital world. Okay, so now we are going to open up the floor. We're going to bring back Brian and Cheryl, just in case there's lessons questions. Um, and we, like I said, we'll have time for about one or two questions. So here we go. Our first question is, how is it best to introduce coding to kindergartners, Brian, who cannot read? This person has tried Google coding and can't see the rest of that, but how would you suggest recommending uh, introducing coding to kindergartners? Other than Seesaw lessons, of course. You know, those Seesaw lessons, I cannot wait to use them in my university courses with the teachers that I teach at the awesome. faculty of ed because they're just going to eat it up too, which is amazing. Love. I would highly recommend students that are unable to read to explore the kinesthetic unplugged coding activities. We have a plethora of them at discovergracie.com. Also, csunplugged.org is a great place to go if you're looking for unplugged uh, paper task coding experiences that use a lot of symbols. The idea is to teach kids the concepts of the the sequential steps and the following algorithms, but they don't have to they don't have to read anything. 
Great. Thanks. And I know that Cheryl had shared also, you know, having students practice taking steps. And we also, as the lessons, as you saw, have those printable ones. So awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm looking to see if perhaps we have time for one more question. Let's see if we have one come in. Here we go. So which of your books, Brian, would you recommend for early elementary teachers to start with? Uh, if you're looking for early elementary activities, I would go with two. I would go with my book, Code Breaker, and I would go with my primary read aloud, Think Like a Coder. Uh, our Code Breaker team also has three amazing books in a Gracie series that you can find at discovergracie.com. Uh, Those are wicked awesome books that model the think aloud process of computer science, but also come with the low tech, medium tech, and high tech uh, classroom examples. Great. Thank you. And don't worry, we'll be sharing those links in the follow-up email in case you missed them. And you also have the recording to watch. So I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. But again, if you had any question that you asked that was not answered, don't worry, we will get back to you and we will make sure um, to answer those questions for you. So once again, thank you all for joining us. As I've said, we are going to be giving away 10 signed copies of Brian's book, When Passion Meets Project. And so we're going to be dropping a um, Google form link into the chat. It's also in the handouts tab. Um, please fill that out. And then that's your opportunity and your way to win. We will reach out to the winners following this session. Now, to learn more about Brian and stay connected with him, um, find him at on Twitter at, at Mr. Aspinall. I saw earlier also on Instagram, and I think it was Mr. Dot Aspinall. Is that correct? Perfect. Yes. And we're also going to be sharing these links as well as other links that he has provided with us, um, his websites, Discover Gracie, as well as Codebreaker. And again, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for spending your morning, afternoon, evening, um, whatever it might be with us. Um, stay tuned uh, for future Learn with the Expert webinars. And if you would like to learn more about Seesaw Lessons, please visit our website, web.seesaw.me forward slash lessons. And just one more time, I know I've said it a bunch. Thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you again soon here at Seesaw. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brian.